Well, hi there, racing fans, and welcome to another edition of Winning Ways. I'll get that right. Uh, a little bit uh, tired this morning, spent the whole night watching golf. How was that golf? Yeah, you know, James, I didn't watch it all, but I see young Duffner managed to smile when he got the trophy. Well, can you imagine being called Duffner, yeah. you know, as a golfer? <laughs> yeah, uh, just for uh, the, the Sky News, they said uh, the, the young Irishman came with a rattle till he stuck one in the water. Is that true? Which uh, Irishman? The world and what was his name? Rory. Uh, Rory. No, he played quite well to, up to a point, Rory. But uh, there was there was a guy called Scott Piercy who made eight birdies in ten holes or something ridiculous. But Duffner, you got to take your hat off to him. He hit it close a couple of times, just unbelievable. It was reminiscent of the Wild Coast. You know, we we yes, had that sort yes. of Wild Coast swing was just unbelievable, oh, and this was reminiscent of it. Uh, so it's another young man wins an, another uh, major winner. Huh? Yeah. And it was some South Africans golf. didn't fare well, eh, James? They struggled, eh? No, they uh, struggled. Only Timmy Clark made it through, uh, who you'd think would be uh, way beyond Sterney and Els and those boys. Uh, Retief, I don't know where he is. He must be injured that point. Well, he's, he's injured. Uh, yeah, injured. Uh, we've got a hell of a show today. Uh, we've got Carl the Doll Burger, all the way from the Cape. He made a special trip up here in his old Cadillac, and he has come to be on Winning Ways. He's been... Um, dying to get on the show, and I think you'll find it quite amusing. There's some stories that are re really well worth watching. So that's in uh, your call coming up at the end of the show, but let's go and straight and have a look at uh, three to follow. Well, just a reminder to you that the horses are at the sales ground. You can get across there and have a look for the national two-year-old sale, which happens on Thursday and Friday. Gary Player's big golf day tomorrow at Royal Johannesburg in Kensington. Uh, that should be fun. And uh, as I say, two days of uh, a day of viewing on Wednesday and then Thursday, Friday. But the horses I are there. It's a good idea, James, going to Thursday and Friday. Absolutely. You know, give the people the weekend off. Let's get the work done during the week. I, I, I really, I like that. And there's going, to be, there's going to be a lot of interest in a lot of horses, namely the Judd Potts and, and a few others. Yeah, yeah, they certainly set the world alight. He's done something no other sire's ever done as a, a first season sire. I don't think Judd Potty has been incredible. incredible. But let's uh, go and have a look at a couple of uh, very nice horses. We picked up three really nice horses now, three to follow. Let's go and have a look at them. Yeah, the first one we pick up was an unraised horse called Santa Carolina. And uh, this is a grey horse. Obviously, the mother was an absolute flyer too. Ella de Vittoria. Ella de Vittoria. So this horse runs in, in Mary Slack's Vogelbos colours, the black with the red cap. It's a grey horse number 13. And uh, this debut was over a mile. And I thought, sure, they, they, they put the money down. It was odds-on favourite. And they were on the button here, James. The horse I thought they had to beat was moving up in red and yellow in second. Wild Ash, who had been runner-up twice. Yeah, Wild Ash was, um, a namesake was a re very good horse trained by Ralph Rickson, if I'm not wrong. Um, and uh, look at this uh, horse of Mike the Cox. It's sitting about three lengths behind Wild Ash. Wild Ash looked to be a blinder in the race until you saw how good this was. Yeah. But this is very good. Absolutely. I think this is going to be a, a very smart, smart horse. This, uh, they brought it out. She's a lovely filly. And she's got a pedigree to boot. But I was watching the race and I thought, here, Wild Ash with the white faces in second now. Moving up very comfortably. Then I glanced across and I saw the grey horse and I thought, no, nah, they've got this one right with the cock team. This is good. Yeah, well, Wild Ash now goes to win her race. But uh, the Illa de Vittoria's daughter absolutely cruises past her by Tiger Ridge. And, Santa um, Carolina. Tiger Ridge is really probably the most underrated stallion in South Africa. Look at this. This absolutely doddles it. She's, this is very, very good. Yeah. And um, she's got the pedigree to boot. She ends up winning by three. Top class. Top class, really. You keep an eye and remember the name Santa Carolina. She's the first of our three to follow, and I, I'd certainly keep an eye on that one. Right, we move on from there and go and have a look at, uh, this was Sunday at uh, Clearwood, and uh, the Bass team have been very quiet until suddenly the Gold Cup, they won the Gold Cup, and now they've stepped out a couple. But did they step out a couple? I think there's about five or six million rands worth of horse flesh in the first two races. 
uh, more than the whole stakes pot for the month. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bear stepped these out. They both got beaten. Both of them uh, showed uh, that they might be quite nice horses. Let's go and have yeah, a look. Yeah, he, he stepped out a few. And uh, this is a very nice horse. It's drawn one. As you can see, it is the grey horse. And it is called Top Jet. It runs a very good race with young apprentice Donovan Dillon. It looked a competitive race. The horse who wins it is an unraced horse as well. Funny enough, 150 grand for the Bezran called Bezanova. And uh, the horse that everyone was on was the runner-up, Terra Nova. So we had a couple of Novas here, but the horse we've asked you to follow is the grey down the inside. Yeah, you see, he just loses it. He's a very big horse. I looked at him in the parade ring. Big, backward, unfurnished type of horse. And he just loses his position here. The horse on his left now, which is the other bass horse, ran fourth. And that's a really nice horse too. And certainly worth putting into calculations in time to come. Oh, Mountain Master. Mountain Master, a really nice horse They're both too. Jet Masters, weren't they? Both Jet Masters. Um, but watch the grey now. He just uh, he can't quicken up with these two. They've got away from him. He's now about three or four off them, and suddenly he gets the hang of what's going on. These other two that ran first and second have been under a really hard ride. And watch the third and fourth horses. They both run on really well at the death, and I think that you'll find this horse, uh, the grey horse, a very nice horse. Very smart debut by both these runners, but I was very impressed with the grey horse. Bear in mind, it came out of trap one, and had to move over. Just having a look at that race, you will see that Clearwood pushed that false rail, the, the outside rail out, and uh, a lot of positive feedback, James. Absolutely, made a huge difference, and the course was in fabulous condition because we had a bit of rain during the week. The rainy season's coming, the courses will be great. Let's go and have a look at the second race on the card, Helderberg Blue. This is another bass runner, and um, this is a very nice filly. Yeah, again, everyone, had, uh, uh, the favorite had run second here. This horse doesn't get away as well as you'd like, the horse that we found, Helderberg Blue. And it looked like Sheikh's Brashi was going to win, but gets beaten by another unraced horse, a JPEG, a very smart JPEG called Jay's Man from the Dennis Dryer stable. But again, Helderberg Blue, Mark Bass just getting these horses. What's this trigger finger on the second horse? Um, no, Sheikh's uh, Brashi, watch uh, in the pink oh. colours, okay? Um, our man Trigger Finger Veal. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. You'll see, he's the, the, the winner's in front. Yeah, the behind win the winner. Yeah. But watch what happens now. And then behind them is uh, Marsh Shirtliff's colours. Yeah. Um, Very nice horse, Marsh Shirtliff. Here the pink colours goes. He goes trigger finger. On his bicycle, 100 too early. Wins, they've got the race won. This yeah. is all over. Helderberg Blue's just behind it with the black cap. or got no skull cap cover. And she's running on best of everything. This yeah. is race over, but just a little early. Yeah, know? a little early. Unfortunately, the, 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 winning post, the winning post is at the, after you've got six furlongs, not five and a half furlongs. Yeah, and uh, this JPEG comes back, very good run. There's the third horse, getting at the race now, Helderberg Blue, very nice. So, Mark Bass has certainly stepped out some expensive horses, but he's going to win a good few races with these. Yeah, I think these horses will probably go back to Cape Town, having had the run under their belt, and uh, you just follow them there. They'll all win, because they look like they can run like anything. Um, as far as Blast from the Past is concerned, we're now going to change slightly. And what we've done is we've decided to take out some fabulous races from the past, and I mean worldwide, internationally. And they're quite interesting to have a look at. A couple of people of our sort of vintage, or my vintage, Laf, you're much younger than me, much will really enjoy watching these and, and bringing back the memories that they bring back. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a quiet period for racing. The at first the one you picked is uh, uh, Arkell, I think. Arkell winning his third Cheltenham Gold Cup. And uh, it's just amazing how he does it. He for for the, the people who don't know, you know Arkel, what Arkel was named after? No. A mountain. There were three mountains on uh, uh, one of the, the royal family's farms. One was Foynavon, yeah. and Foynavon was a bad, bad horse, the biggest ruffy to win the Grand National. Everything fell, yeah. except three horses. At the, at the point of and fence. Arkel, and the, yeah. the, the third one uh, was St. Paddy, I think, with the three mountains. So Arkel was named after that. Well, um, it was uh, owned by the Duchess of Westminster. He was probably the greatest steeplechaser that ever lived. Yeah. And this was his third Cheltenham Gold Cup. And just have a look at this. He hits one fence so badly, <laughs> most horses would have been stopped in their tracks. And he goes on to absolutely doddle it. He was an absolute superstar.
She comes up to the next. Storm in second. Snaker third. Sartorius and then Hunt. Another complete circuit. Oh, and he barely took off at that one. He just looked at it and ignored it. And how he got the other side. Well, you should have heard the gasp from the crowd here. It looked as though he wasn't going to jump at all. Of course, rounding the home turn, a great roar from the crowd now as they see him level up. Absolutely effortless he is at the moment. Surely he's not going to take any chances with this one as he did before. No, he jumps it like a champion. Roars from the crowd as he goes away. Dormant's jumping it second. Snego's jumping it third. And there's Arkel striding up to the line. The runaway winner of his third successive Gold Cup being chased vainly but gamely into second place by Dormant with Snego just hanging on to be third. That mistake from Arkel on the first circuit really was extraordinary. We had seen something similar of course in the 65 Whitbread at Sandown but the reverse angle shot shows how perilously close he was to dashing the dreams of a nation. Yet again, he showed his survival instincts, and by the time he had jumped the final fence in glorious isolation, the 10 to 1 on price at which Arkel was returned almost seemed like value. It remains the shortest SP of a Cheltenham Gold Cup winner. Well, marvellous pictures, marvellous commentary. Yeah. Vainly but gamely, he was Peter, chased. Peter O'Sullivan, would you think it was? Possibly, yeah. Possibly. It sounds like it could be. Ma him. Magnificent. Uh, the, the, a horse hits a fence like that today, you just got no chance. Yeah. And those fences in those days were much, they were much wider and much sturdier. They, James, you, the brush you, worked, was, you, you worked out there. Did you ever go over the fences? Yeah. And what is it? Birch, isn't it? Yeah, it's, Nigel Birch. Uh, yeah, Nigel Birch. It's all I'm, Nigel I'm Birch. I'm mate in, the, in uh, Spain, Nigel Birch. Nigel he runs Birch. a restaurant in Spain. Yeah, great golfer. Called Birch's Grill and uh, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Grill Birch. and Toasted Salmi. Grill Grills are not in Burroughs Rolls. <laughs> yeah. But tell me, uh, uh, James, the, are the fences different today? Oh, yeah. They're, they're not nearly as, as broad. Those In those days, they were about 18 inches broad with sticks. Those, yeah. those, those twigs were yeah. uh, half an inch wide. Um, in diameter, and they were sturdy. If you hit them, you just came down. Today, they've made them much narrower so that the horse can go through the top, and the fences aren't nearly as big. Yeah, right. And th those horses in those days really... But I think that um, horses, humans, everyone's become a lot softer today yeah. than they used to be. You know, yeah. in the old days... I wouldn't t tell that Rugby to, players were tough. Yeah, to, to race horses rugby were player. tough. Yeah. <laughs> they were tough, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> big bunch ask of Alan, softies now. Ask Alan Sutherland yeah. about uh, you know, a couple of, uh, yeah. couple of things that Moff happened Marburg in the scrum. Moff Marburg and there. Alan Sutherland yeah. and people like that. They were they're big softies. Yeah. But I'm not going to tell them... <laughs> No, but who rode it? Pat Taft. Pat Taft, yeah. Good he, rider? He was, a, he was, well, he was one of the top riders of his generation. And um, it was fantastic that um, Anne Duchess of Westminster owned the horse because she is passionate like the, royal fam the whole royal family is. And to win your third Cheltenham Gold Cup and be one to ten, you know, every single person in Britain backed the horse yeah. to win it. And he nearly c came down. My Has his record been equal? Did uh, best no, no mate? One's, no one's ever won three, what about this three in a row. Oh, three in a row. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Very best interesting. He's won three, didn't he? Yeah, and then this, the, the horse has just retired. Uh, the name escapes me. Fantastic jumper. The name, the name escapes me is a, was a horse trained here in Durham. Yeah, that's right. He, <laughs> You're getting, uh, we're getting into the Mr. realm Hill's of, of impossi his name is? Im impossibility at this stage. <laughs> but um, three Cheltenham Gold Cups, that was the beginning of it. And yeah. oh, I, I do enjoy fantastic. some of the old footage from yeah, that Next time. week we're going to have Mill Reef. We'll show you Mill Reef winning oh, his, his derby, and which is fantastic. I think it's a great innovation we've come up with, and we've got a couple of other innovations in the pipeline, but let's go and have a look at the Plum of the Week. about to get a taste of the bit got three to make up at this stage captain on the run travels by three parts of a length skit skizzle now about to be asked for the effort princess juliet is on the inside 
Approaching the 200 meter marker, Captain on the run, Skit Skizzle's looking to come alive, Princess Juliet is on the inside, Captain on the run by a neck, Skit Skizzle's trying his utmost, but Captain on the run has his head in front, Captain on the run looking for the line, Skit Skizzle lunges late, Captain on the run a nose, from Skit Skizzle, Princess Juliet six lengths away to Albert. Well, that's uh, Sean Cormack at his best, and he's riding really well at the moment. Every week we, we, we are talking about him, we're lauding him or praising him, and, and he deserves it. And uh, he was chased by some good riders too, and some good horses. A great finish, James. Well, great finish, and, but you could have got three to one about this horse on Interbet, you know, three to one. And uh, they backed Skit Skizzle, they backed him. Bling Kamalo came down to ride um, the, a couple of uh, Sean Terry runners, including this horse, Skit Skizzle. Bling next. Kamalo. Bling Kamalo. That's his, Bling Kamalo. Yeah, they call him Bling now. He, yeah, there was a big article in the Mail and Guardian about yeah. Bling Kamalo, and really he's become a household name. And that's um, it. good for him. He, I think he's a hell of a rider. Hell of a rider. You can bling on the rest. Yeah. And you he, know, he's, <laughs> he's very, very good. But James, how about your dash hunt in that race? Senor Jose, the dash hunt. Senor Jose in sixth. What are you up to? <laughs> <laughs> He's got the shortest Was legs you've ever seen. Johnny Gerona's got longer legs. <laughs> <laughs> well, there yeah. you go. James has uh, thrown one in. He's lurking up for later. I know he's thinking. Yeah. Okay. Well, can we move on to current <laughs> affairs, which are much more interesting than talking about their chance? Hi and welcome to Current Affairs. We had a couple of Group 3 races uh, down in Cape Town today. Nice to see that we're getting back into the group racing. And we've also got a Group 3 that comes out of uh, the UK at Haydock, which you'll find interesting when we go through the race for you. And James has got a little bit of news of been what's been happening. But James, a bit of racing down in Cape Town. The Champagne Stakes starting off things down well, there. Well, yeah, it was Princess Victoria's swan song. This was her uh, final effort, and uh, she goes to stud now, and I think that she deserves a... Uh, she'll probably be a very good broodmare. She's extremely well-bred, Victory Moon, mm. one of the first Victory Moons. And um, she's a superb racehorse, and she always yep. has been. She's taken on the best. She's locked horns. She's had a lot of wins, and uh, it'd be sad to see her go, but... Uh, Every dog gets his day off, he goes to stud. Yeah. Any well, ideas who the stallion's going to be? I'm, I have no idea, but um, I'm, no sure idea. That, um, I'm sure that I'm sure she's owned by main chance. She'll probably go to Silvana. Yes. Um, maybe. Yeah, that um, would be the favourite. They've got, they've got a, a whole host of really good horses there. Black mm -hmm. Menaluge, you never know. Yeah, with, correct. You know, including the new one. So, um, Gitano, Nandas, he's yeah. also there. And let's go and have a look at the race. Let's go and pick it up. Just in behind that comes Princess of Victoria in the yellow. She's tracking them with La Patineuse further back behind that one. They followed by Machis, Miss Saigon towards their inside as they race down towards the final 600. In the centre, Victorian Secrets now come forward to pick it up. The Witch Doctor down the inside. Princess Victoria races just in behind the leading group. They followed by Abbey Creek over towards the inside. Then comes La Patineuse. Miss Saigon is trying to keep closer. Machis races in behind those. Victorian Secret still in front, but Princess Victoria between runners is now starting to kick home nicely. The Witch Doctor back towards the inside can find no extra. La Patineur is behind that. Fly by night after being slow start is now starting to run on late in the closing stages. As they come inside the final hundred, those Victorian Secret and Princess Victoria. And Princess Victoria is claiming the advantage. And Princess Victoria going to bow out on a winning note. She draws away to win. Princess Victoria, mighty impressive from Victorian Secret back in second. Got tight behind that for minor money. There we go. A great filly ending her career. Ridden by a great rider who seems to be uh, half five in a long way out. Well, good for him. You good know, for him. He, um, Andy, um, lovely to have him back in the saddle. and have Great him rider. He's always the, the, the greatest fun. Him and Anton Marcus at the track in the morning. You've got to have the two of them. They, they, they make going to track fun. Yeah, but they must be good cop, bad cop. One guy's yeah. extremely, extremely bubbly, and the other guy is, I don't know, he's, he's always looking for something to beat him. Who, Anton? Yeah. No, but, but Anton's, uh, Anton's a studier, so he's, he, yeah. he's, he's um, I would call him... He's more him, of a pessimist than another guy, I'd an optimist. I call him an Einstein. He's, so, he's sort of... Uh, he's, Einstein? Yeah, he's always... That means one beer in German. Well, that's right. Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> so she called him one yeah, beer. He's a one beer boy. Nine fingers and one beer. That's his name, but he's a great rider. Nice to... I saw him at the track, James. He's going to be back soon, eh? Yeah, in fine form. 
fight for. for. He said that he's um, chubbier than Andrew Fortune, which yeah. is hard. I don't <laughs> think it's But possible. the wit of Andrew Fortune? Yeah. The wit of Andrew Fortune and Anton Marcus is a combination that we could do. Yeah, with, they're both sharp, know. sharp brains. Sharp as, sharp as yeah, Two very, very good riders. We're, we're lucky to have them. And we're going to come back after this short break. Right, the next uh, Group 3 we've got for you was the final fling stakes. And uh, James, again, it uh, didn't go completely according to plan for some of the fancy runners. Yeah, but uh, the winner is by Galileo, and she deserved her moment in the sun. And yeah. Um, yeah, Sean Cormack was at his best on this one. Yeah, let's go and have a look at the final fling stakes. It's a grade 3 race. We'll talk about it afterwards. They being followed by Gypsy Madonna, Dancing Dynasty three deep outside of those. Then comes Take Your Oath back along the inside, Bella Nera further back, Imperial State seven, eight lengths off them, Donkey Poo in behind that one, Shimmering Jet racing well back and Spring Beauty is still your trader. They're about to come off that false rail with just over 4.50 left to the line and Rain Gale brought the field for home from Schism racing up in second. Dance for Gold behind that race is third and Margaret Court is deeper out in the track. Gypsy Madonna is starting down wine cash register. Dancing Dynasty right towards the outside is also starting to get into it. It's Rain Gale in front though as they come down to the final 300. No more from Schism along her outside. Margaret Court is in behind that cash register. Rain Gale is flat to the boards but she's still in front. Margaret Court is coming strongly up the outside. Rain Gale though is keeping chance. Challenged by and Rain Girl going to stay on and win. Rain Girl goes on to win. Imperial State flew up for second. Margaret caught behind that race third. Schism, I think, might have just held fourth with Nonky Poo the outside. Yeah, a very gutsy win. Good ride by Sean Cormack. And uh, well done, Justin Snaith. It's his Australian filly. And uh, as uh, James said, by Galileo. So uh, a great addition to the bonds of breeding. Front running tactics um, showed to perfection you know when you go find a rider sitting in front dictating and then kicks at the right time and holds on uh, I, I just um, I, I think that's the artistry of being a good jockey and you know very few can do it mm. properly six horses and just over one and a half length so quite a quite a close finish yeah 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 all right the the next one we're going to bring to you is is going to be the race from overseas from Haydock a race called the Bedford Rose of Lancaster Stakes it's a group three and let me give you a little bit of history about this. The favourite in this race was a really restricted odds, a horse called Telescope. Now, Telescope had tried, they're trying to rush him with two quick gallops to get him ready for the Epsom Derby. And uh, he, he had come up Shinsu and they couldn't get him ready. He was taken out the race. He's from a wonderful yard, Michael Stout's yard. And then what happened was they brought him back off, they got him right, and they said, this is a superstar in the making. And yet he's come back run. And if I'm right, I think he won by 24 lengths in his comeback run. And this was his second run. He went off at restricted odds. He's called telescopic, but he's beaten by a horse called David Livingston. Watch this race. Mission begins to pick up as they head down with about three furlongs to go. Telescope, three from the left, is coming through now to mount his challenge. On the extreme left is Noble Mission. The red jacket of David Livingston is still battling away there. Black Spirit behind those. Area 51 on the extreme right. Heading down towards the last furlong. David Livingston putting up a real fight to Telescope. Noble Mission's a length and a half behind him, but now begins to power home. Heading inside the last furlong. David Livingston is in front. Telescope can't get past him. Making progress all the time is Noble Mission, but it's David Livingston and Johnny Mercer have won. Telescope and Noble Mission, it's a tight thing between them, second and third. They're clear from the pace set at Area 51. Then she poops in. There you go. Now, David Livingston is trained by none other than Michael de Kock. Mm. Fantastic, Jim. Well, <laughs> you know, it's a trademark sheepskin nose band. Um, Johnny Murder wrote it and <laughs> wrote it perfectly. And his horses just worldwide are hard to pass. Yeah. And when you look at this horse, this horse raced in um, Dubai. Yeah. He then went to Royal Ascot and was very unlucky. The wrong Royal side Ascot. of the course. So he's kept him going. And I see some of the horses that ran down the field. There were horses like City Star, Quick Wit. They were raced in Dubai with distinction, but they haven't come back. These mm. horses of Mike's come back. And Telescope and Noble Mission are very good horses, and they couldn't go past this horse. Interestingly enough, this horse here, David Livingston, Michael's got it now. By Galileo, very well bred horse. But the last time it won was September 11. Comes across to Michael de Kock, he rejuvenates it, and it wins this group three like a very good horse, James. I think he's taken a, a lot of time and a lot of work to get this horse right. And, uh, but it just shows what type of trainer he is to, to go and win a race like this. Um, and I think he's had a handful of runners in, in England this year. Um, I don't think he's been out the money. Fifth is the furthest back yeah. he's been. 
with uh, the runners that he's had. His statistics have got to be world class, yeah. you know, in, in, in England. And I know he's over there um, getting... 500,000 rand first take. Well, he told me he's getting, he's getting ready for... His, the, this weekend's a big weekend for him. He's got um, the Arlington Million. He's got the Apache going there. Now, an interesting thing about the Apache, the Apache was nominated to run in Turkey. Yeah. Did you hear about that? I, I read somewhere about it, and the Turkish official said... Because he had been given an African horse sickness, he wasn't eligible. Is that correct? That's, that's the most... It is the biggest set of double standards I've ever seen in my life. Because Mike went there with Musur, okay, who was champion two-year-old here. Had his injections. Had his injections here. He went there and he won the big race in Turkey. So now to stop him going there, they said, no, because the horse had an African horse sickness injection in his passport, it can't go there. This is iniquitous yeah. you know, uh, that you they know, can get away with this. I agree with you. Anyway, James, their excuse was the other one slipped through because it was an Australian horse. And that's hogwash. They uh, both should have got in there. The Apache should have been allowed to go to Turkey. Well, and he's, going to, he's going to Arlington. To Arlington. the Arlington Million. And his warm-up, he ran fourth in a very, very strong race. And I think that he's pretty strongly fancy for the Arlington Million. And um, the other two runners that he's got on the weekend are Shea Shea in the Nunthorpe. And Soft Falling Rain is running at York as well. They're both running at York, I think, on Saturday. What distance would Soft Falling Rain be going to? A mile or uh, seven? Seven furlongs, seven I furlongs. think, yeah. He's still seven for seven, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. What a racehorse. National yeah. Assembly. Eh? And um, it, it's unbelievable what these horses have done. Just, you know, nowhere in the world have people taken horses and gone and done what Mike the Cox done. Yeah. And he's having another crack at the Arlington Million. I know he was desperately unlucky not to win it uh, last time. Johnny Murder. Johnny Murder, Johnny to, Murder. To KB Shea, I mean, <laughs> that was the end of that. Yeah. But it shows you, um, he's off there this this time, and I think Christoph's riding the horse. Um, and he's well, got James a huge weekend. Uh, they, they fly it in? We got a yeah, we got a huge weekend ahead of us as far yeah. as South African racehorses are racing overseas. Yeah, it looks very, very good. Um, but I'm, I'm, pre I'm pleased that he's, he's flying the flag. And, and you know he's opened up that, that's, uh, the new market yard for people with top horses to come along and get their name out there and bring the horses. He'll uh, get them trained and it, it'll certainly be a, a good filler for the industry. I, I think that it will take off. I think that mm -hmm. um, the first year is just a sort of feeler. The people are getting an idea. But his statistics are just phenomenal. If you've got a horse that can run, get the trouble is, is that how long it takes you to get there. You know, you got to do months here, then months in um, mm -hmm. uh, Mauritius, then another month. Look, you know, James, it, so it's got to be uh, just thinking It's actually loud. worse than it's ever been. Absolutely. Yeah. We've we got to try and get it out when it's the English off-season. But yeah. by, by that, by, by in the same time, there are big races all over Europe. Yeah. It's just a difficult one. They've got to try and resolve these protocol problems. I don't know what the answer is, though. Yeah. James, talking about them, didn't they have the, the Jacques Marat this weekend? Yeah, the Jacques Marat they had, and it was won by um, Freddie Head's horse, Invincible Spirit horse, um, and uh, won convincingly the mare. Um, she was not the fancied horse. There were a couple of real fancied horses in there. Dawn Eclipse was one Dawn of Dawn Approach. Them. Mm. Dawn Approach. That must have been favourite, James. That was favourite. And the, the other filly, uh, something Kate, what was her Elusive, name? Elusive, no. Uh, Elusive Kate, who beat, uh, we showed the race, race last week. Uh, Top filly. She beat the, the grey Sky Lantern. And That's she right. ran down the field. So a couple of them ran down the field. But Freddie Head was confident that his horse could win. So the French are still very, very strong. Oh, they're, they're incredibly strong, the French. And I'm just trying to find it here. Um, but I did... I did have it on the, yeah. on the screen anyway. Um, it was uh, a bit of a shock. Uh, Dawn approach, maybe not as good as everyone thought he was. Maybe you know. danced a few dances. Well, that's the point. You know, he w won the, the 2000 he won Guineas. Um, he won the 2000 the year, Guineas. Then he went to, back to Ireland. Then he went back, back to, to England. To Derby. You know, Royal he had a terrible time at the Derby. Then, then he won a hard race. Did he get beat at Goodwill or York? Yeah. Uh, Toronado beat Toronado him. Yeah, he's had a beat. tough But he had a campaign. very hard race at Ascot as well to win. Do you remember? Correct. With, with Toronado. Yeah, Correct. Toronado. Yeah. So, um, Maybe, Maybe caught up. You know, even the top, the champions. Uh, yeah. Dijinsky was a classic example. Right. He had a very hard season and got to the Arc de Triomphe and uh, that was it. You he know? lost the tri And then he went and back to the champions stakes champion and got beat as well. And got hammered in the champions Yeah, Sassafras beat him. That's yeah. right. You know, it's a, there's only so much you can push out of the toothpaste tube. It's yeah. hard to put it back in. Yeah. But uh, as I say, even the best trainers in the world, their horses can go wrong underneath them. You and know, and they battle to keep them going. That's why Mike de Kock's such a genius because yeah. he... This was David Livingston's been going for seven, eight months. You know, yeah. it's ridiculous. You know, yeah, he's, just he's picked his marks and unbelievable. He, anyway, we look forward to some great times and um, especially 
now we can, uh, you know, get horses that can't go to Turkey. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, you know, I, I, I believe they're, they're taking it up with the Turkish well, officials just to get know, back on it. The, 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 that's that's got to be the worst decision as far as Turkey's concerned that they could ever make. We've that's been it. thrown out the olive branch to them. We've had their jockeys here. We've looked after them. Mike de Kock's been over there and been the ambassador and won their race. So they don't want him to win. So they say no, because it's got an African horse sickness injection in his passport, which was done two years ago. Yeah. You know, to work that out. That's bloody, it is ridiculous. One, you're not allowed to travel because you've got African horse sickness in the country. And then you are allowed to travel, but you're not allowed to come to us because you've injected the horse against African no, horse No, you've been sickness. vaccinated. Ah, you can't come. Please. No, Carl no, Berger's going to be much more fun than that. He'll be a anyway, lot more so, fun. Uh, have you got any other news, Joe? Um, no, I think that's about I it. I think it's quite yeah. good. And I think a lot of you out there have got to watch this Carl Berger thing. James did interview. I haven't seen it, but James tells me it's priceless. Every now and again, we are uh, lucky enough to get a uh, very special guest on this show here at Winning Ways, and uh, someone of interest is always well worth chatting to. And most of you uh, will know who Carl Berger is, but not uh, have an insight into where he comes from, what he's all about. Carl Berger, one of the uh, leading lights in Cape Racing, and uh, very nice to have you here with us. Carl made the trip up here in your Cadillac. Yes, you know, James, uh, I felt to have a few days off away from racing and uh, I thought well let me come up and that's why I gave you a call and uh, thanks for having me on your show. Are you staying at Brahms flat? No, I'm staying in... Uh, you got other mates here? Yeah, no, uh, North Beach. Okay, well you got lots of mates in Durban. You started your life in Durban. How did it all start? Jimmy Knox is obviously a huge man and a huge name. Well, actually, James, it started long before Jimmy Knox. You know, I lived in a block of flats. I grew up in a block of flats called Keswick Court. And uh, flat number one was the Bentons. Flat number 12 was the Buckhams. Georgie Askew stayed next door to me. Um, I think there was a trainer called Mr. Whiteford or Whitehead. He stayed in number three. So it was, and then, then there was the late Boxer Malone stayed in the... So I was always around racing people from a very young age. And uh, in that block of flats, I think a couple of jockeys stayed there, guys like Percy Kayo. Um, I can't remember. I mean, I was young. I was only like four or five years old. And, and did, that was the days that they were still working on the beach here in, in Durban. Yes. Well, you know, my father, when he was off duty, my, my real father was a policeman. Mm. And he was always, because uh, Rufka Jackson was his big mate, mm. he, and he was a trainer. He trained also at one, the, um, I think it was a Clearwood Winter Clearwood Handicap Winter, yeah. in 1960. It was called King Size. Mm. And uh, my father used to take me to the beach with him all the time. And then eventually my father hired um, uh, Umfan to take me to the stables in the afternoon to watch the horses going for a walk. So I've always had an interest in horses. And um, from day one, I've wanted to be a trainer. Early on in my uh, life, I never had the opportunities because those days your fathers had to have money. If you went in the no, nobody gave you opportunity. But the point is, is that you've pursued this passion forever. And now you train in Cape Town. And there've been some people that have made a big difference in your life. And I think the Browns, the Brown family, Herman Sr., Herman Jr., Herman Sr., Sr. Um, yes. you've been, how did you hook up with those guys? How did you get to know them? Well, um, Mr. Brown, 
they used to come downstairs to a shop called Family Tea Room to have uh, coffee in the morning. All the trainers used to come there. And my sister and I used to go down to the shop. I mean, in our pajamas and Mr. Brown always would give us a penny or something to buy sweets. And uh, my father was actually good friends with Mr. Brown. And then it came about that uh, Jimmy Knox worked for Mr. Brown. You know, so that's where association came in. And Herman and I went to school together. Herman Jr. Herman Jr., yes. At uh, Damlin, we were at school together and, and Kloof uh, High School. How's your golf? No, my golf's very bad. Is that your phone? Not mine. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your golf's very bad and you hung around Herman Jr. Yes. Oh, no, he was a good golfer. I used to follow him around the, uh, around the golf course. Well, yeah. obviously the race course too, but uh, the golf course. And um, you grew up with this parallel interest. He was involved through his family yeah. and you just loved it. I loved it. Being, were you a punter? Yes. I mean, that was our game. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like other guys used to go out to make money doing other things. Uh, I mean, I was actually born right across the road from the main gate here. At, uh, that was Mother's Hospital. Yeah. And uh, like I've always said to everybody, my ashes are going from the 100 metre mark to the finishing post at Gravel. Well, there's a lot of ashes, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I know, have a look. Could be a bucket load. But, but Carl, Jimmy Knox um, yeah. was hugely influential. Now, most people who knew Jimmy Knox saw him as a sort of bit of a mover and a shaker. He was a manoeuvrer. He knew what was going on. He was one of the sort of gambling underworld in, in racing. Yes. Well, Jimmy loved his gambling. I mean, I used to go to many joints with Jimmy, where Jimmy would sit on his haunches for, geez, 10 hours playing dice, play cards, play this, play... But I met a lot of interesting people, you know. But one thing with Jimmy, and uh, Jimmy was a hard taskmaster. And in the beginning, I thought, oh, you know, Jimmy's married to my mother, he doesn't like me, and this and that. But I tell you what, James, that hard work is paying off today. Because, mm. you know, um, I get emotional over it. Because I've realized today, since I've got older, what Jimmy has really done for me. And he's taught me, you know, he used to bring me to the race course here, yeah, give me a race card, same like Joey Soma's father. Mm. I was listening to the show with Joey Soma and I thought, oh, you know, because Joey's, uh, Summer's father and Jimmy were big mates too. Mm. And uh, when Joey was talking to you about how his father gave him the race card, and go, Jimmy done exactly the same to me. Which, uh, you know, it's taught me how to look for horses. Yeah, well, because you've been very successful looking for horses. You've yeah. found some very nice horses, um, not at the top end of the market. Um, but I just want to get the early days sorted out before we move on to you as a trainer, because mm. you, you got involved in some very interesting things. The, the one story you told me, which was fascinating, which I think people would love to hear, is a story about George Croucher and you um, traveling uh, in, in the caddy at one stage. Give us, a, give us the background. And well, well, you know, uh, Titch is known by... Titch, everyone knows yeah, him Titch. as Titch. He's Everybody Wuzzy knows Eddie's, uh, uh, agent. agent. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we all you hung around... You can bury him, eh? He deserves to be buried, you know. He buries everyone else. <laughs> uh, it's time no, that he got wow. buried. Well, anyway, let's see. Um, you know, all of us guys from Gravel here, we all used to come to the race course. Brian Maxwell, Bert Leclo, you know Bert Leclo? Yeah, the fam world-famous whaler. <laughs> yeah. You know, every time you see him on TV, he's whaling. Yeah, he was fantastic. His son was fantastic yes. in the world swimming games. Yeah, we all hung around together. And one day, Titch won a Cadillac from a guy called Peter Berenzi. So, Titch says, well, let's go off to Cape Town. So we all jump in the car, we're off to Cape Town. We get to Bloemfontein, we've got no money for petrol. Tit says, don't worry. So we go into a court case where a farmer is held up for murder for something. So Titch goes, gets the family and says, listen, the judge is my uncle. 
don't worry, I'm having dinner with him tonight. I'll sort it out. But, but we need two and a half grand up front. And when it's done, you give us five. So the next day, we're all in the court sitting in the back. Act of God, the man got not guilty. So we got the five grand. So now we're off. We turn off there, going down past Colesburg, Hanover, somewhere down there. Titch says, no, wait, hold on. We need to get a few more pound. He sees on the thing, oh, uh, farmer... H.M. Portkit or something. So anyway, he pulls in there. Now we don't know what's going on. So Titch says, no, just leave it to me. So he goes there. He jumps out the car. He says, warm potty. This, that. And he eventually convinces the man that this is his late lost uncle. So anyway, at the end of the story, the man says to him, well, Georgie, where are you going to? No, we know a good thing in Cape Town. It won't get beat. So Titch finds a horse, geez, a 66 to 1 or something. The man parts with 20 grand. 20 grand? 20 grand. In those days, 20 grand the man parted with. Where did he pull it out the safe? Yeah, well, those <laughs> farmers, they got plenty. <laughs> anyway, we're off to Cape Town. But now one pot is behind us. So we get to Mulnick. And he's bucky. Uh, You're in the Cadillac and he's <laughs> bucky. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we, I think it was Kenilworth. So, you know, the man's there and all excited. So the horse wins. At 66 to 1. At 66 to 1, the horse wins. We don't have a ticky on because Titch never put a ticky on. And uh, the man is jumping and everything. So Chich says to him, takes the race card, he says, no. He says, this is a progressive plate. It's got to, we're only backing it the next time. It's got to progress to the next race. I mean, the man didn't know about racing, but, you know, that's just one of those stories. But one thing I can tell you about Titchy, whenever he got a pound, or he, I mean, the mayor of Escort, he pulled 10 grand. We are coming from Swaziland. <laughs> run out of petrol, not escort, he shall we? Yeah. And uh, he walked in the man's office, talk about racing. The man says, keep quiet, come in the back room. He walks out with 10 grand. But one thing I can tell you about Titch, when he's got money, he gave all the boys. Well, let's take a break. Etienne was my idol. He was kid cult. I mean, I grew up in front of Etienne and Etienne, geez, what Etienne done for me all the time, every time, Etienne. And uh, I needed a few pounds and Etienne had a hundred rand and he gave me 50 rand. So, you know, Etienne also used to help all the battlers. He was very generous too, you know. Charlie Good, Etienne, Alan Burke, uh, Mickey Friend, um, you know, all those old guys from, uh, I remember here in Gravel, Joe Langerman, you know, all those old guys. So Gravel was your, uh, basically the hunting ground, Gravel, Clarewood, yes. Scottsville, did you go much up to, to Scottsville? Yeah, we used to go, you know, we all used to uh, get in the car and off we go. In the We're, Cadillac? In the Cadillac or whatever, you know, and... Uh, put a few pounds together, put petrol, we all go to Maritzburg. But not too often. Mainly uh, Maritzburg racing, we used to go to Natal Tadasols. Yeah. I mean, and what was it? West Street is uh, one of those streets. Um, uh, Field Street. Field Street, that's right. Yeah. And, uh, oh, it was pretty packed on race days. You know, and then you get characters like uh, Franco the Barber. Um, sure. Franco Brian, the Barber, yeah. Yeah, Brian Malone. What, what did he do? He was a barber, wasn't he? Yeah, no, yeah. that's what it is. What about Harold Robertson? He was the barber as well. They I called him the barber, Harold Robertson. Yeah, I didn't know much about Harold. I knew he had a few horses, but I don't know much about him. No. But uh, You were in a different echelon, yeah. different playing field. Yeah, different. Play well, we were in the lower echelon. <laughs> they were the higher echelon, you know. But... Uh, 
You know, the tables have turned. Yeah, the tables have turned in yeah. big time. Yes, very big time. All right, so now you've gone through all this basis of how you love racing and how you involved. Tell us about what happened now you want to apply for a license. How, how does a guy like you apply for a license? I know you work for Herman for a bit of time. Yes. I work for Herman and uh, I'm actually a qualified farrier. I went to the farrier school. That's where I met you. Yeah. In Johannesburg in that uh, lovely house you had at Newmarket. <laughs> Newmarket. <laughs> with that uh, massive photo of your father. Yeah. On the wall. Yeah. It wasn't a photo. It was a painting. A painting. Yeah. Painting, original painting of my father on the wall in his pink hunting jacket. And the yeah. first story you ever told me that your uncle went out with Zaza Gabor. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely right. you got a good memory, Carl, but you went to Ferrier School, yes. went through all that. That was with the Fenroyans, wasn't it? Yeah. And then uh, in 81, I got kicked by a horse. And like, uh, after I came out of hospital, the door shattered my bone on my leg. And... Um, I like sort of gave up the fairing and I came back to racing. I decided, no, you know what? I'm not going to see any future here. And I went to work for Metro Rail for 20 years. And What did you do there? Electrical fitter. That's it. So you actually yeah. qualified as an... Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, and then while I was there, I met a few guys and, you know, done a few little bit of this and that, got a few pounds, started dealing in diamonds and gold and and uh, started to come well. So I created a wealth for myself to come back into racing because racing was always in my mind. From a small child, I wanted to be a racehorse trainer. That's what I wanted to be. Mm. And look, I've achieved my dream. You know, I've always got a saying, the future belongs to those who believe in their dreams. Correct. And... Uh, I mean, I, I came back to racing. Um, I was helped by Selwyn Moodley. He signed me on as a stable employee. Mm. And Roy Moodley looked after me. They sent me to Cape Town with six horses. And I won a couple of races. And then I came back here for, um, I left Cape Town 14th of February, 2005. I was back in Cape Town on the 1st of March. Because Cape Town's lovely. Yeah. I mean, I Only just the Cape enjoyed Town it. people love Cape Town. Yeah, well, well, I'm a Durban boy and I love Cape Town. <laughs> but, um, yeah, because you're the big fish there. Well, you know. No, no, you've no. Got, you outsmart those guys. Most of them are in a sort of, you know, a little bit of a sort of dream world. They look at the mountain and, you know, they dream about things. Well, you And know, you're probably playing them on a break, Carl, because... Uh, you know. ja James, one thing with me, I don't mind anybody's business. I concentrate on what I've got to do. I don't, if people come and tell me stories about this one, that one, and that one, I'm not interested. I'm a positive person. I just think of what Carl's got to do. I don't worry what other guys are doing. Well, it, it stood you in good stead because now you went back to Cape Town yes. um, and started on your own. No, no, no. I went back uh, for Selwyn Mudley. Oh, you went back there? Yeah, you yes. came, came here and then yeah. you went back for Selwyn. Selwyn. Right. Um, then, then Selwyn turned it up and I came back to work for Wire Mooring. Okay. And then uh, I left Wire Mooring and I went back to Cape Town. And um, I was on my way to Namibia and I had a bad car accident. I rolled the car six times. Yeah. And then I was dead. And uh, I was in the hospital. I was in a coma for two months. And I came out of the coma and all that and ever since then, ever since after that accident, everything has just fallen into place. Um, Andy Williams bought me a horse and Brom, that's how I met Brom. Through Andy Williams. Through Andy Williams. Yeah. And um, they bought me a horse at Sabaya called Lady Dapalu. I think we had that horse on three to follow once and everyone said to us that we'll never win a race and it won its next race or the race after that. We said this yeah, will win Yeah, won the next race. race. Yeah. Won the next race, Richard Furry. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Anyway, and that's how I met Brahm. And I tell He's you, been a huge influence, Brahm. Talk to us about Brahm. Tell us about him. Hey, Brahm has not only helped me with horses. He's helped me on how to run a business and... You know, Brahm's been a big inspiration. I mean, I know Brahm's got horses with you and with uh, uh, Laf 
and a lot of trainers. But he's always like sort of stuck loyal to me, you know. Mm. <clears throat> and he's helped me in a lot of ways, not only racing, also business-wise. And he's been a big help. He's been a big in inspiration. I, and I'm really grateful he took me under his wing. Well, you've tr certainly trained a lot of winners for him. And, um, you know, obviously the highlight of your career was uh, winning the Gold Vars. Yes, you know, um, Jill Simpkins, one day standing up here while I was talking to why I said to you, you know, my biggest dream is just to win a race at Gravel. A race, even if it was a maiden. Because I was born across the road, Gravel is my home ground. And, uh, geez, look how lucky I got. I won a group two with the horse you bred. <laughs> we, we, were, we were all the most excited people on the race course that day. It was sure. just absolutely fantastic. And, you know, you, you've got him beautifully prepared and placed in the race. And I think um, he was brilliantly, brilliantly ridden. You know, oh, that, Richard that really rode a, a fantastic pearl. ride. Yeah. No, no, if it wasn't but for Richard. You've had many other successes in Cape Town. Tell us a bit about them. Yeah, you know, um, I read on the African betting gland, some guy calls me, uh, calls me the Barney Curley of, of South Africa. Do you know who Barney Curley is? N uh, I've come to learn that he's some punter or trainer or something that when he puts the money down, they come home. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that's how I like to be known. Uh, look, I'm a punting stable. That is, I mean, I haven't got many horses. I've got 30. Yeah. But uh, horses that can't run, I don't run a pet shop. Mm. If they can't run, they're out. Yeah. I've got pets. I've got four German Shepherds. Those are my pets. <laughs> horses have got to earn. Look, I try and do the best for every owner that I've got. You know, not every year you can please everybody. But... Uh, one thing they know with me, if their horses can't run, goodbye. And, and you've got a couple of now, lately you've picked up a couple of decent owners. Yes, you know, Bernard Cantor bought me a horse. Oh, that is a huge yeah. one, yeah. Yeah. Um, Andre McDonald, the owner of Google, hmm. he's giving me a horse. You know, um, there's Brian Katzen who owned a share in Cossack. Yeah. He, uh, look, I, sw I swapped from Man United to swap... Uh, to support Swansea because he owns Swansea. Yeah. You know, I always support the people that support me. Sure. Well, who wants to support Man United now? They've got some sort of second-rate manager. When they had Ferguson, it was a different class. Yeah. No, it's, it's a nice uh, time to move, I can yeah. tell you. You know, Swansea might <laughs> no, be no, on no. the No, no, no. I was... Uh, when he... When Swansea went to the first division, that's when I changed. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, you enjoy your soccer, don't you? Yeah, I know. Soccer is lovely. Look, I, uh, look, I'm not a Chelsea fan, mm. but the way I see it on paper, mm. I think this year Chelsea's a bock to win that oh, cup. Nonsense. You're all wrong. Arsenal will win this year. Oh. If they get Suarez home to Rome. Oh, wow, well, you know. But as far as you're concerned, you've got these yeah. 30 horses, you've got some nice horses. Where are you stable? Yeah. You know, I'm uh, stabled at Philippi. Okay. You know, uh, James, look. Do you find the snakes entertaining? Very. Justin's yeah. my mate and John. Well, that's what yeah, they're entertaining. It's all about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I, uh, sometimes when Justin come to my office, I say, "Look on the wall. Who, who runs second? Who runs second? Apparently, you've got a big, a fantastic office with a yes. big. Uh, I don't know what they call them, HD televisions yes, and all that the, thing. Yeah, I've got and two. You like the good things in life, yeah, Carl. Well, you know, um, when I was young, I couldn't afford it. Hmm. You know. Uh, the first day of school, I had my cousin's pair of shoes on to go to school. So that's, I can tell you, I come from. And you know, one thing I want to tell you, James, is that some people believe it and some people don't. But here in Gravel, we never knew about apartheid. The first time I learned about apartheid is when I went to the army. Yeah. Because, yeah, we used to live, it was like Woodstock. We lived all amongst each other. Everybody played football in the park at Sutton Park. We didn't know about all this nonsense. And, and how, was your, how was your army days? No, army days were good. Yeah. yeah. Who, where were you? What was oh, that all about? I, I was at uh, one SSB and then I went to um, Volfers. Volfers Bay. No racing in Volfers Bay? No, no racing. I got, uh, I got 30 days uh, CB yeah. for backing Indian fantasy, ridden by some Australian girl. 
I found the old man Brown and he told me Indian fantasy will win 25 to 1. I went in there, the corporals caught me, I finished up getting 30 day CB. But who cares when you've had, uh, when you're winning 250, I had 10 rand on. I mean, those days, 250 rand was a bit of money. Yeah. So, it was a bit more than your pay. That's it. I mean, I think those days we were getting about 50 rand or something. Yeah. A month. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, look, the army, I mean, the army pulled me right. I mean, taught me a lot of things. I think uh, they should bring it back for every young guy. You know, yeah. uh, I think it's, it brings people right. And let me tell you, school days, you can go and ask the, the guy that owned Big City Life, Glenn Mitchell. He will tell you, gravel racing on a Wednesday, guaranteed the headmaster wouldn't see me at school. Because <laughs> I was here at Mansfield, just up the road here. Oh, you were one of the Mansfield boys. There are quite a yeah. lot of famous Mansfield boys. Yeah, you know. But um, Wednesdays, race course. They used to come and look for me, but all the bigger guys used to chase them. <laughs> so I was happy. So racing's been in your blood all these years. Yeah. And you really have made a name for yourself in Cape Town. Any chance of you moving back to KwaZulu-Natal? No. I love Cape Town. Your family settled, everyone yeah, settled no, there? everybody settled there. I'm doing well in Cape Town, James, you know. Um, it's not, you've got to know the tracks and all that. Like I told Mace Roberts one day, he was there at Philippi, I said, Mace, Keep on working your horses there, you'll go home a maiden. Mm. And then eventually he started working on the other tracks. And I think he had two winners, uh, quickly. Mm. You know, uh, Cape Town's a funny place. You've got to know the tracks. You've always been a guy who's quite open with information <clears throat> and yourself and wh what it's all about. And I think that that stood you in good stead. Um, and is your career what you wanted it to be? Uh, you know. Would, would there be anything that you'd like to change? Racing as well? Is there anything in racing you think could be improved? Um, yeah, in racing, I think the clubs could do a lot more for the trainers. Mm. Um, I don't know about here, but in Cape Town, sure. I mean, I've, uh, my tar and where my horses have got to walk, there's like big holes in my yard. You know, if you don't do it yourself. Put in, you must put in a chit, you know, you put in a chit and say to them, this is what you've got to do. That's, no, that's they know. Up. I've been yeah. complaining about it for the past four years. But uh, let one of them get hurt and then you'll see the club go to Supreme Court. Mm. Let one of my horses get hurt and Carl, then you, they will be in Supreme Court. You, you love your horses. Oh, you yes. love this business. You love racing. Yes. What else love is there it. for you in life? No, 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 racing. This is what I've wanted to do. I, I watch sport on TV. I don't even go and watch rugby anymore. I just watch racing. My wife says, geez, all, why don't you just uh, subscribe to 239? Because that's all you watch. <laughs> England, where, even the kart racing. I watch it all. It fascinates me. I, I love horses. You know, it's because this is what I've wanted to do. I mean, I, uh, I've taken a few days break because I've been going for four years. 24-7. Mm. I mean, a guy, owner can phone me 11 o'clock at night. I'll sit and talk to them. And I do it seven days a week. Sundays, I'm there at my office, 6.30, 6 o'clock, and I'm there until 12, 1 o'clock. Because this is, I've got the opportunity and I don't want to let it, let it go. Because yep. this is what I've wanted to do. Well, we're going to call it a day there because you're a passionate man. And we wish you all the success that you deserve. You've been a, a very good addition to the training ranks because there are very few people that can pull themselves up by the bootlaces like you have. Kohlberger, congratulations. And uh, may you have many more winners. It's wonderful to have a guy like Carl on our show. And um, there you go. If you want a passionate man to train your horses, you don't have to look much further than Kohlberger.
second position by Millington, goes and giving them a bath. That's one of the biggest millions I've ever seen. Grace Valana, the leader. Grace Valana. Grace Valana has 